Good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, we uh, will be praying that, uh, that our weather is not too bad over the next couple of days, but I'm so thankful that you came out tonight to worship the Lord. Uh, we're going to begin with some singing, so if you'll turn to number 708, 708. You know, because of our sins, we deserve punishment, even the punishment of death. But instead, the Lord gave us an opportunity to become children of God, and so we're so thankful for that. So let's sing, Behold What Manner of Love, number 708. <clears throat> Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Behold what manner love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That And that is a great love. So let's turn now to number 630. Number 630. Sounds like something on a clock. <laughs> 630. Um, what a friend we have in Jesus. And we know that uh, the Lord helps us and guides us every day in our daily life. He's a friend that we can count on. So let's sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? Thank you so much for your singing tonight. Um, I'll mention some announcements. Uh, have some wonderful things upcoming, and we're so thankful for them. Uh, but first of all, uh, so I don't forget about it, I want to mention the insert that was in the bulletin about the mission trip to Honduras. If you're interested, Dwayne Baird is your contact person, the person to ask about. But it's in December. It's from December the 10th through the 18th. The cost is $1,500, which is really reasonable for a mission trip of that length. 
And uh, so if you're interested, um, see Dwayne as soon as you possibly can so that you can find out all the information. But the insert is in the bulletins there. Uh, this coming Sunday in the morning service, we'll be having communion, and so we'll look forward to that in the morning service. And then uh, in the evening service, we'll be having um, our fifth Sunday singing, and we're looking forward to that. We've got some really uh, great songs and singers lined up, and uh, you want me to mention that? Okay, and, uh, and then at the end of the service, we're going to have a wedding. So it's going to be an outstanding time. Brother Lamar and Miss Barbara are going to get married at the end of the service this coming Sunday night. So we're looking forward to it. Don't get cold feet, right? <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> All right. Uh, also this Sunday at 2 o'clock, the youth and adults are going to be playing Ultimate Frisbee at Wicksburg High School. That's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, senior adults, next week is our next senior adult lunch and Bible study. That's on October the 1st, and that'll be at 11 a.m. in the Fellowship Building. We're having spaghetti, garlic bread, and salad. That sounds really good. Um, then Sunday, October the 6th, is our... Um, Harvest Sunday, and that's going to be a wonderful day. Really looking forward to it. Um, just to give you a preview, every one of the choirs is singing that day, the, all the way from the children all the way through the adults, preschoolers, everybody. So we're looking forward to great music, and we're going to have a, a great guest preacher, Brother Fred McCoy. And then after the service, we'll eat lunch in the fellowship building, and we won't have any evening service or activities. Please bring sides, casseroles, and desserts for that lunch. The meat, bread, and tea are provided. Um, but that's going to be great. And then our offering goal is $70,000. And all of that offering goes to our building fund. October the 6th, also on Harvest Sunday, in Sunday school, we want to have as many people as we possibly can for Sunday school, and we're calling it Amp It Up, and that's short for all attendees and members present. So if you're an attendee or a member, we want you present, and uh, we hope that you'll be in Sunday school that day. Looking forward to that. And then finally, our fall festival is at the end of October, October the 27th, and it'll be here before we know it. Anybody else have any other announcements? All right. Colby, would you mind leading us in prayer? Amen. Thank you so much. Well, I'm still up here. <laughs> Brother Tommy and I are switching places tonight. He's going to do the prayer uh, request, and I'm doing the Bible study. He asked me a, a few weeks ago if I would do the Bible study tonight, and so I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 63. I know you're not surprised that a music minister would pick a psalm <laughs> for, uh, for uh, the scripture, but uh, Psalm 63 is what we're going to look at tonight. There's 11 verses, and uh, I'll try not to take too long to go through those 11 verses. Um, tonight, as we look at Psalm 63, I'm going to ask myself, and all of us here tonight, are we thirsty for God? Do we thirst for, for the Lord? Um, I got to thinking about being thirsty, and uh, there's a lot of times that I'm thirsty. Um, here lately, we've had a sweet tea in the refrigerator, and it is so good on a hot day. Um, but a couple of things that I thought about thirst... 
I grew up in West Georgia, Northwest Georgia, so I grew up on Eastern time zone. So it didn't get dark in Cedartown, Georgia until about nine o'clock um, during the summertime. And so when I would get, uh, well in the summer, uh, after you eat supper, which we usually ate fairly early, you just went outside and played and played and played. <laughs> and you played all the way till dark until nine o'clock. And uh, you know, we'd go ride our bikes, we'd run, we'd uh, play ball. Uh, where I grew up, we had lightning bugs. And so we'd chase lightning bugs until we were done. Well, I'm not proud of this. <laughs> But whenever I'd come in at 9 o'clock or after, I would immediately make a beeline to the kitchen sink. And now I was much smaller then than I am now, but one leg would go up on the kitchen counter, <laughs> and then my mouth would go under the faucet, and that was the best water in the whole world. Now, if you... My hometown is Cedartown, Georgia, and we actually have a spring, and that's where we get our water from in Cedartown. So it was good, cold spring water, and that's the best water I've ever drunk in my life. And so that was, that was one way I quenched my thirst, was climbing up on the kitchen counter and drinking out of the kitchen sink, out of the water faucet. But another time I think about thirst was... Um, in, the, in August of 1998, I had the privilege of going on a mission trip to Romania. And I was there a little over a week. And, of course, I had never been there. And they said, oh, it's, it's nice and cool there in the summertime. Well, it wasn't in the August of 1998. It was hot. It was close to 100 degrees most every day. And they don't have the air conditioning that, that we do because usually it doesn't get that hot. They also said, well, when you get there, you can buy a box fan. Well, what happens when you have a heat wave and everybody doesn't have air conditioning? They go buy up all the box fans. So we couldn't find a box fan anywhere. So we got really hot every day. And um, back then, and it may still be true now, um, as an American, we couldn't drink the water because uh, I, there was things in it that would upset our stomach. So we couldn't drink the water, and we couldn't have ice. Even ice would make us sick. So we drank Cokes, we drank Sprites, we drank Fantas, and I don't understand it, but they had sparkling water, and they, <laughs> they drank that too. Well, we couldn't find just regular old bottled water anywhere. So by the time I got back to the United States, all I wanted was ice cold water. And that, that tasted so good when I got back. So I, I told you all that to say, do we have that same thirst for God that we have for these other things that I've talked about? Um, as we look at Psalm 63, I want to give you a little background. Some of the commentators think that David, when he wrote this psalm, was on the run from Saul. And some think it was later in his life when he was on the run from Absalom, his son. But most of them seem to go with Saul, so that's kind of the way I'll go uh, with it. But this is a psalm written by David, and he is on the run. He is fearful for his life. Saul is jealous of him because Saul, I mean, David is going to be the king, and the people like David better than they like Saul, and he's jealous and he wants to kill David. So David is on the run, and he's in the wilderness, which I always think about trees, but it's just the opposite of trees. It's desert and rocks and caves. And so I want us to think about that as we look at Psalm 63. And let me read it all, uh, if you'll follow along with me. Psalm 63, a psalm of David, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. 
early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness. And my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak lies shall be stopped. So as we mentioned, uh, David was in the wilderness. This, uh, this area would have been <clears throat> on the western shore of the Dead Sea, there in southern Judah. And uh, Saul was looking for him to kill him. And you can imagine how desperate and how distressed, how difficult David must have felt. Um, to the best of my knowledge, I've never had anybody wanting to kill me. Um, I hope I never do, but I can't imagine what that must feel like when you know for sure that somebody's looking for you, and if they find you, they want to kill you. And that is what is David is dealing with right now. And one of the things I thought was really interesting was the fact that here Saul is seeking David, but who is David seeking? He's seeking God. And that, that's really uh, amazing to me that instead of focusing on the circumstances that David was dealing with, he was focusing on God, which is exactly what we should do. Whether we're uh, in a joyful time or a terrible time in our life, we should focus on God. Um, <clears throat> if you'll notice here in verse 1, he says, Oh God, you are my God. So he, he reminds us of his relationship with God. And then he says, Early will I seek you. And that just shows us that he was prioritizing the seeking of God. It was important to him. And then he says that his soul thirsts for God and his flesh longs for God in a dry and thirsty land where there's no water. And that's where he was. He was in the wilderness. Um, I got to thinking about this word seek and thirsting, and especially the word seeking. We know that Saul was seeking David to kill him, David was seeking God in the middle of these bad circumstances. But I got to thinking about seeking. That's more than just kind of looking around to see if we see what we're looking for. Seeking is an intense search where we're really looking closely for whatever it is we're seeking. And here, David is seeking after God. You know, I got to thinking... Um, about how my kids look for things. You know, you might, you might tell your children, go get those shoes, those red pair of shoes. And they'll, they'll go in their room, and they're in there about 15 seconds. And they'll turn around, and they say, I can't find them. I can't find them. I don't know where they are. I can't find them. And I know there's been so many times where my kids have said, I'm looking for so-and-so, and I just can't find it. And, and either Miranda or myself will say, I bet you if I go in your room, I can find it in 30 seconds. 
And almost every time we can find it. One time Luke was looking for a pair of shoes, and we're like, how can you not find a pair of shoes in your room? I mean, it's not like you're looking for something really small in a big auditorium or something. You're looking for these big shoes in, in not a really big bedroom. But the difference between how parents seek after things and how kids seek after things that should be the difference of how we seek after God. We should really look. And you might say, well, I've already found God. And that's true. If we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we have found God. And we're so thankful for our salvation. But that's just the beginning. Because our relationship is supposed to grow more and more and more. We want more and more of God, and so we need to seek after him continually. And you say, well, how do we seek after him? Well, we seek after him by spending time in his word, spending time in prayer, being here in times of worship. Um, we seek him by listening. You know, so often when we pray, we spend most of our time talking but we need to spend time listening as well. So anyway, we see here in these early verses that David was seeking after God and he thirsted for God. And in verse 2 it says that he looked for him in the sanctuary, which for them would have been the tabernacle. They didn't have the permanent temple yet. They had the tabernacle, but they did have wonderful times of worship there. And it was there that, that David would see God's power and his glory, and we've seen that as well. We've seen God work, and it's, it's wonderful to see. But then let's look at verses 3 through 5. Here we see David's praise for God's goodness. Uh, look in verse 3. He praises, he praises God because of God's loving kindness that's better than life. You know... The world tries to offer us so many substitutes. Anything that God can provide us, Satan and the world will try to provide a cheap alternative. Um, beauty, excitement, purpose, um, so many things that we really need in our life and only God can truly fill. The world tries to fill us with substitutes that are just not nearly as good. And so here in verse 3, one of the qualities that David mentions is God's loving kindness. And then in verse 4, he says, I will bless you while I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. And so we see how passionate David is about God's goodness. And then in verse 5, he says, My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness. Do you notice here that maybe David is physically hungry and physically thirsty also by some of the things that he mentions? He mentions about there's no water. He mentions about a dry and thirsty land. And here in verse 5, he says that his soul is satisfied like marrow and fatness. I, I just, when I read that, I think about a big juicy steak <laughs> and how good that is. And he says that his soul is satisfied with God like we would be satisfied with a wonderful meal. And then he says, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. So we see that David's response to God's goodness is to worship and to praise him. And then if we look at verses 6 through 8, we see David remembering God's goodness. He says, I remember you on my bed. Now what kind of bed <laughs> would David have right now? Probably just a flat, flat place on a rock or flat place on the ground. But even in the bad circumstances that David was encountering as he was hiding from Saul, he says, I remember you on my bed. 
I meditate on you in the night watches. I got to thinking about some of the things that David might have been thinking about. He might have thought about the battle that he had with Goliath and what a victory that he saw God work through him when he defeated Goliath. I'm not, I think, too, maybe he even... He may even have thought back when he was a little bit younger and he battled a lion and the way God protected him and helped him and gave him strength to battle a lion. He might have been thinking about the times that he was watching the sheep and uh, the beauty of the night sky. You know, without all the city lights, the, the lights in the sky are that much brighter. And he would have, he would have seen the beauty that God had made in creation in the sky. But as I read these verses, I got to thinking, where do our thoughts wander to? Where do our thoughts go? Hopefully, whenever we have a free moment, free time, maybe we're getting ready to go to bed, go to sleep, do our, do our thoughts wander to the stresses of the day? or the stresses of tomorrow, or do they wander to the goodness of God? And not just the goodness that we're looking forward to with God, but also the goodness that he's done for us in the past. When we think about all that God's done for us, it's, it's a good thing, and we're, our soul is satisfied. Um, look at verse 7. He says, because you've been my help. And we talked about some of the ways that God's been his help. I love this next part. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. And I just think about it like a, a mama bird protecting her little baby birds. The shadow of your wings. And so as David was there running trying to have his life spared, he knew that God was protecting and looking after him, and he acknowledged that in his praise to God. And then look at verse 8. He says, My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand upholds me. Now, if I remember right, when the Bible talks about your right hand, it's talking about strength. Because... Not everybody, I think about 15% of the population are left-handers. How many of you are left-handers? Oh, come on, there's got to be, uh, Miss Miranda up there, yeah, <laughs> she's a lefty. All right, uh, Karen. Um, but most people, their strong arm, because they're right-handed, is their right, their right arm. And so here we see, that David knows that the strong right arm of God is the one that upholds him. And he says, my soul follows close behind you. When you're a little child and you're in a situation that's a little scary, you tend to cuddle up and get close to mama or daddy or grandma or grandpa or aunt or uncle. And that's what we see, that David was cuddling up close to, um, to the Lord and, and acknowledging his protection. With this storm coming, there may be children that need reassurance. They may need to know that God is in control. And so uh, we'll rem we will remember that and hopefully remind our children, grandchildren, etc., cetera, um, as the storm approaches in the next day or so. Let's look at verses 9 through 11 as we as we uh, finish up these verses. Here we see God's goodness and his justice. Saul is on the rampage wanting to destroy David because of his jealousy. And David says, But those who seek my life to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth, I think that's probably referring to the grave or death. Um, they shall fall by the sword. Well, of course, that does refer to death. They will fall by the death of the sword. 
and they will be a portion for the jackals. The wild animals will eat their corpses. And so what we see here is not uh, a, a bloodthirsty revenge that David is wanting, but he's seeing that God does punish sin, and God does um, look after those whom he loves. And so he is, uh, he's, David is reminding himself and those that would read this psalm is that uh, evil will not prevail. It may prosper for a time, and we see it prosper. I think every day we see evil prosper here or there, but evil will not ultimately win. Good will ultimately win because God will ultimately win. And so here we see that David, though he was innocent, he was being pursued by evil men. But I'm reminded of Romans 8.31, if God be for us, who can be against us? And of course, David didn't know that verse because that verse had not been penned yet, but uh, it's so true. If God is for us, who can be against us? And because God watches over us at all times. And then if you look at verse 11, but the king shall rejoice in God. Well, King Saul was the king of Israel, but David had already been anointed by this point, and uh, we know that he was the true king. He was God's choice to be king at this point, and so who is going to rejoice in God? David is going to rejoice in God. And then the next part of the verse says, Everyone who swears by him, not by the king, but by God. Everyone who swears by God shall glory. But the mouth of those who speak, their lies shall be stopped. So once again, we see that God is in control. And David is reminding us, even as he was fearing for his life, that God is in control. Um... I didn't pick this because of a storm coming, but that's a good time to remember that God's in control when, when a storm is approaching. Um, God is in control when we get a diagnosis that we don't want to get. Um, God is in control when there's uh, dysfunction within a family. God is in control, and he's the one that we can run to and get under the shadow of his wings. We can be upheld by his strong right hand. But most of all tonight, I want us to thirst after God. Want to be closer to God more and more. Um, I've certainly been in church all my life, but I know there's so much more about God that I need to learn. And one of the reasons it's so important to read the Bible is because we can read one, we can just take this psalm. We can read it when we're 22 years old and God may say one thing to us. When we're 42 years old, he may say something else to us. When we're 52 or 72 or 92, he may say something else to us. We may read it today and then two weeks later read it again and God will say something new to us. I'm not saying that he's changing the meaning. I'm just saying he's pointing out new things because there, the Bible is like a multifaceted diamond. There's always something to see. There's always something to learn because God is infinite. He is infinitely beautiful and great and wonderful and we need to thirst after him and know more and more about him so we can become more and more like him. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. We thank you for the way that you love us. We thank you for the way you protect us and guide us. And Lord, this is such a wonderful example that David showed us 
of his thirst for you, his wanting to know you more, his wanting to experience you more and more. So, Lord, I pray that you'll give us a holy thirst for you. And, Lord, help us to rely on you and trust in you as we encounter the obstacles and the dangers and the toils of our life. In Jesus' name we pray.